Good evening to um, all Korean alumni based in Seoul and other parts of the country. And good morning to those joining from the United States. This marks the 24th uh, Go Blue Society talk. And tonight we're very pleased to have a very distinguished um, speaker who is a well-renowned professor and and our friend, uh, Dean Mike Solomon from Ann Arbor. And uh, before he gives his update on campus and uh, his talk, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Jung Guihan, the president of our Korean Alumni Association, to give his uh, brief welcome remarks. Dr. Jung. Thank you. Um... First of all, let me thank uh, Dean Solomon for uh, venturing to give a talk. <laughs> good morning and good evening. So uh, I also like to thank um, Michelle and the staff of the RECOM for preparing this uh, seminar. Uh, when we first talk about this seminar, I was a bit concerned because the topic is sounds to me very technical. And uh, I was wondering, you know, whether uh, there will be a lot of interest in such a technical topic. You know, why butterflies are blue and, but that's uh, like a material science topic, right? I'm looking forward to hear what how butterfly is linked with the material. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad, you know, more than about 50 um, alumni members uh, registered for this event, although uh, the number doesn't show 50 yet. And uh, uh, I'd like to thank our alumni members for their uh, interest and participation in this um, event. And uh, I look forward to learning a few things about uh, the topic as well as the situation in Ann Arbor. So once again, thanks very much, Mike. Thank you, Thanks. Dr. Zhang. And I would like to um, introduce um, Dean Mike Solomon and just give his uh, brief bio. Mike Solomon is the Dean of Recon Graduate School and Vice Provost for Academic Affairs Graduate Studies at University of Michigan. Uh, he's a professor of chemical engineering and a professor of macromolecular science and engineering. And he has been a member of the Michigan faculty since 1997. From January 2013 to June 2017, he served as an associate dean of RECOM, where he focused on academic programs and initiatives, including working with the school's faculty um, and cross-campus initiatives on graduate student mentoring, in addition to his work with programs in engineering and the physical sciences. Mike has received numerous awards in recognition for his excellence as a professor and member of the university community. He has been a recipient of the NSF Career Awards, 3M's Non-Tenured Faculty Award, and the 2011 um, Soft Matter Lectureship from the Royal Society of um, chemist, chemistry's journal, Soft Matter. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and of American Physical Society. He received his Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and Economics from the University of Wisconsin at Madison in 1990, and his PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley in 1996. Uh, now I would like to um, welcome um, Dean Mike Solomon, who will give us campus update first and commence his talk. Mike. 
Thank you so much, YJ. Um, I first like to begin by thanking you, YJ Chang and, and Dr. Kyun Hyun Jun, and all of you from the Alumni Association for the chance to join you this morning. We're a small group, and I'm, I'm really, that makes the possibility to have some uh, dialogue and exchange. I've left plenty of time for uh, question and answer, and I am planning to give a light talk. I, hopefully, the title of the talk doesn't uh, doesn't warn anybody off, but uh, I think that any, anybody that's uh, interested in learning more about what's going on at the University of Michigan on campus, and then also uh, is interested in color and where it comes from, I think you'll enjoy uh, my light presentation today. You know, at the University of Michigan, I have um, a number of roles. I have both Dean of the Graduate School and also a chemical engineering faculty member, and I'm really delighted to be able to address you in both those uh, capacities today. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen and then um, I'll start with a brief campus update. So it'll just be, this is the, the part where we always hope that it works well. And just a quick question there. I've seen Michelle nod her head, so looks like we're, we're good. So let me start with, with uh, greetings from, from uh, Ann Arbor. Let me just make sure my keys are working here. One second, great. Okay, so greetings from Ann Arbor. I wanted to start with a campus update uh, before talking about um, some, some science topics. After that, then we'll have time for uh, questions on, on both topics. So my update will be somewhat from the perspective of our university's many graduate students. Um, I'm, not, I'm focusing on our graduate students really because of my role and also because they're central to the university's mission. You know, they work on cutting edge research they teach our undergraduates. They are, as alumni, go on to great careers as scholars, artists, public servants, engineers, and, and, and more. And Rackham is the home for these graduate students for, and for research-based education at the University of Michigan. I know that some of you may not be Rackham students, or you may not have a full sense of the graduate uh, school's role in the university, which also has changed greatly um, since, since uh, over the years. Rackham is the hub for grad ed at Michigan, there's more than 8,500 students enrolled in Rackham's doctoral, master's, and certificate programs, and they are in every UM school and college, from social work to engineering to business uh, and through to public policy. So if you're in those schools, very often you're a Rackham, a Rackham graduate, and especially if you're a PhD student. We partner with graduate faculty and programs across the campus to advance excellence in all aspects of graduate education and try to create a vibrant and diverse student community. We provide resources to help our students uh, with professional development, mentoring, counseling, emergency funding, and more. And if you were an undergraduate at U of M, you likely at some point were taught by a Rackham student because uh, they frequently work as teaching assistants. Before I tell you about what is happening in Ann Arbor, I did wanna take a moment to acknowledge just the extraordinarily difficult circumstances and really collective pain we've all experienced over the course of the last 12 months, not just at the university, not just at Michigan, but across the whole globe. We've grieved the devastating impacts of the pandemic and virus on our families and our friends and the places we call home. Um, and there's been a tremendous loss of life and these uh, impacts are felt all over the globe. I also wanna recognize the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on communities of color in the US we continue to navigate the challenge of that pandemic while at the same time, we're holding hope that vaccination and other control measures will progressively bring it under control. I also wanted to say at the same time, the US has been undergoing a racial reckoning as we confront the killing of black Americans and other people of color at the hands of the police. We've also been confronting a rise in xenophobia, racism and aggression directed at Asians, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, including a recent mass shooting in Atlanta. You know, we all feel anger and pain at the frequency of racial violence in the US. And I know this in particular this week has been a very challenging one for, for these reasons. So I think it's very correct to say that these events have affected every member of the University of Michigan community. You know, through all these challenges, we are still proud that our research labs are open, that our academic medical center is seeing its full complement of patients and that all our courses have been offered, albeit mostly in online formats. At the same time, we know we have students who have not been able to travel to Ann Arbor for their studies. Perhaps you know some of them and are pursuing their studies or their research from home or even elsewhere. 
And although the challenges with racial injustice persist, we believe that the situation, at least with respect to the pandemic, is slowly improving. In Michigan, nearly 40% of adults have received at least one dose of the vaccine. So just for a moment, turning ahead to what we're thinking the next academic year will be like, we have a, a, a certain amount of optimism. The university recently announced a preliminary plan to return to campus for the fall term with most classes outside of large cl lecture classes being taught in person. This plan presumes that all faculty, graduate student instructors and staff who wish to be vaccinated will have access to the vaccines before the fall semester starts. And we appear to be on track for that. And then also a significant proportion of students will have been vaccinated as well. And we're creating incentive programs and ways to make it easy for students to be vaccinated even now before they leave um, before the end of the, of the current term. So under this plan, research opportunities are gonna to continue to expand so that students at all levels of study, graduate and undergraduate, will have opportunities to engage in their research activities under what will seem like pre-pandemic conditions. Residence halls will be open at nearly 80% capacity and most student facing services such as libraries, museums, study spaces, sports facilities, other programs uh, will have expanded in-person opportunities. Um, but we're still gonna be including remote options since we understand that um, different students and different faculty and staff are at different places with how they're, how they're um, uh, navigating the pandemic. UM, UM Athletics, just for a moment, I'll, I'll, uh, what, they're planning to welcome fans into the stands to cheer on our, our Wolverine teams at the Big House, the Crystal Center and other venues um, as allowed by public health measures um, that will be in place at that time. So this return to the campus plan aligns with the university's goal of an innovative and responsible return to in-person education and a residential campus experience. It should be closer to one like we all love and remember uh, about UM. In town halls with students, I've acknowledged the uncertainty about the pandemic's progression, but also stressed um, the values uh, of the value of our shared goal of moving forward to take advantage of the, of the on-campus life of the university as soon as we can do that safely. So I wanna take, uh, before I, one, one, and one more um, update uh, about the campus, I just wanted to take a brief moment to focus on Rackham graduate students for a moment. Um, I know that uh, so, you know, so many of you have uh, graduate degrees, and I think it's a good example of how University of Michigan um, supports its students in general at this moment. As I reflect on the last year and look ahead to the next, I'm really aware that the pathways our graduate students um, needed to take or they did take uh, have, have proven to be much more difficult than uh, they would have been in, in earlier years. Um, and it's been made more complex by the fact that they play these multiple roles at the university as instructor, teacher, um, um, researcher, scholar, and student. I think these, uh, these uh, challenges have been particularly intense for in international students. There are currently about 250 South Korean students enrolled in Rackham programs. Um, the majority of these students are here in Ann Arbor, although a few of them have traveled back home um, and they're pursuing their studies uh, there during the pandemic. I've actually met virtually with Korean students in both places in the last year. Um, I wanted to describe, um, I'll describe more in a moment, but I'm quite optimistic that newly admitted Korean students will be able to join us here in Ann Arbor for their studies next year. The pandemic has required new ways to support all Rackham students in their studies. And I'll use them as an example of the, of the supports that the university has provided. In response to the disruption of the last year and in planning for fall 21, uh, we've been listening intently to the voices of our community. And I have a few, uh, um, kind of supports that we've offered listed on the slide here. We've adjusted our grading policies in the last year to include satisfactory, unsatisfactory options. We've also extended our academic deadlines for candidacy and for filing your dissertation uh, as a way to be more flexible and also to for support students' well-being and success. We worked with all 105 doctoral programs to offer these students affected by the pandemic additional time and funding to complete their degrees, since many of them didn't have access to labs, uh, collections, fieldwork sites uh, at the height of the pandemic. Over the last year, we also provided very significant emergency funds, over $1.2 million for students for a variety of reasons, including those who were stranded away from Ann Arbor as the pandemic began and for other unexpected costs. This was especially important for international students who aren't able to access other funding sources because of the nature of their visas. 
Um, the US government also provided some emergency funds for US citizens and permanent residents. And Rackham was sure to extend uh, the same kind of funding to international students so that they would receive the same categories of support during the pandemic. Um, and also last summer, Rackham worked with many dozens of incoming international students to allow them to start remotely from wherever they were located since consulates and visas were closed. Um, we allowed them to draw on their fellowships and also even hold research assistantships and teaching assistantships to allow them to start their students' just uh, studies just like any other. So I think while uh, looking ahead, like while many international students are likely to face continued difficulty um, getting to campus in the fall due to, due to backlogs and visa processings at consulates around the world and other travel restrictions, I'm pretty pleased to, very pleased to report that it's unlikely that this is gonna be the case, I believe, for Korean students. Our International Center support uh, reports that our the US Embassy in Seoul is, is, uh, is making and keeping visa appointments and there's, um, there's less travel restrictions for our students arriving from South Korea. So I'll, I'll of course be continuing to monitor the situation um, for all countries, because uh, it really is critical that our international students know how much the university um, is, is welcoming them to pursue their studies at, at all degree levels, undergraduate, master's, and doctoral at the University of Michigan. So to wrap up at this part of the remark, um, let me say that I am quite optimistic um, that, our, that our long journey through this period of uncertain disruption uh, will be hopefully concluding uh, and we'll be moving uh, into that space in the next academic year. So I'm gonna, that's, that's the update. I'll be happy at the conclusion of the talk to, to take a, um, have additional discussion about it. And now I'd like to uh, uh, turn to our next topic, which is a, a light one. Um, and it's uh, really designed, uh, it's a talk about science and engineering. And it also uh, engages uh, Rackham, Rackham students uh, as well, since the individuals that, who have collaborated with me in this uh, research are all Rackham students. And uh, I think this will be of interest to, to anybody that um, uh, enjoys nature and enjoys color and enjoys science. So I'll be trying to give a little bit of a why uh, as to why butterflies are blue, and then a little bit of why that might matter uh, in terms of things that we care about for human society and the public good, like new materials and medical treatments. So to begin with, uh, I'd just like to, uh, we can kind of take a step back here and think about color in the natural world. So I have a few examples here. So all of you know about carrots. Um, this is a purple cauliflower that uh, uh, in the in the spring that we are in in the fall that we'll we'll have uh, in, in our family. Uh, these are examples of of natural coloration coloration available um, in the in the in, in the in the living um, in living systems. Uh, those are produced by pigmentation. So it turns out that. Uh, that those colors are the same ones that, for example, that make fall leaves uh, turn orange and red. They're carotenoid molecules. And the way they work is they basically block out the sunlight at certain wavelengths, certain, at certain colors, and not others. And that's how you get color that color as opposed to a different one. Another mechanism of color uh, in the natural world is bioluminescence. Um, if you have fireflies in your part of the world, we do every summer here in Michigan, uh, they emit light. Um, also, a lot of marine organisms emit light and even bacterial life. So sometimes if you're walking along the ocean at certain times of the year uh, and you see the surf, it'll, it'll have a color as well. And that's another biological coloration mechanism. The kind of color that butterflies have is, is different. It's called structural color. And I want to introduce that to you. In the natural world, if you see blues or greens, they are often not produced by pigmentation. Uh, they are produced by this different mechanism. It's very hard to make blues uh, and greens in, uh, by another mechanism. And structural color is the one that I'd like to speak about today. Um, one thing I'll say is that, uh, you know, we, we, uh, I've talked um, the, on the left, the pigmentation, that is uh, um, color in plants. So you might ask the color, well, what about color in animals? And often, for example, that color in animals comes from the fact that they actually eat they can't produce it themselves, but they eat the vegetable matter that has those colors. So it's the reason why shrimp have the color that they do or, or flamingos are pink is because they eat plant matter that has that color. They don't produce it themselves. But the, the uh, blues and greens that I'm talking about, those are produced by uh, a variety of different organisms. And uh, they tend to be animals because it's actually a very complicated mechanism by which it's produced. And it's not chemical. That's what's really, it's called structural color. The pigmentation comes from certain chemicals that uh, interact with the sunlight 
uh, absorb some wavelengths, don't absorb others. Or bioessence is a chemical reaction and that there's an enzyme that produces light. Structural color is from the arrangement of microscopic building blocks in particular beautiful patterns uh, that you can only see under a microscope. So now I've brought back uh, the picture of a butterfly. This is a morpho butterfly. It's a particular species that has a brilliant blue color that, um, that uh, is often used as an example of structural color. If I were to take a microscope, and there's more than one microscope you can use. There's a, you can use uh, an optical microscope, kind of like what we've used at, at uh, all the way you know, from, from grade school up into college to, uh, that uses light, or we can use what's called an electron microscope, which can uh, observe even smaller features um, as small as a nanometer. So my scales here, a human hair is about 100 microns, and I'll use that. Uh, I'll use that as a scale when we talk about. So those blue um, uh, kind of fibers that you see there, each one of those is about the width of a human hair. And if you then take your electron microscope and look inside one of those fibers, you'll see these other ordered structures that are on the right-hand side of this image. They're these kind of very ordered arrays and they are um, about a thousand times smaller than that of a human hair. Not a hundred microns, about a hundred nanometers, which is a thousand times smaller than a human hair. So the blue that you're seeing in those butterflies, and this is where I'll, I'll talk about how this connects them to engineering, is um, from this very pattern, if you like, pattern of structures that the animal has produced, in this case, the butterfly, um, on this scale that's a thousand times smaller than a human hair. And that's the key point that we're gonna try to uh, investigate and understand in the laboratory as we move forward. So where else do you see structural color? Once you know to look for these blues and greens, you can really see them everywhere. Um, there's other kinds of butterflies. Here's a butterfly that shows a green structural color. Many beetles show iridescence. Peacock wings are structural color. And if you look inside these, and this has been done by, uh, by biologists, if you look deep inside them with a microscope, you'll see these very beautiful patterns that are on this scale of a thousand times smaller than a human hair. Another kind of organism are squid and octopus, and I'll have more to say about them. They also have this iridescent sheen that they use for camouflage. There's many birds. Um, in our part of the world, we have starlings. So anytime you see like a shimmer uh, of color, often there's not, it's not only just blue and green, but also as you turn your head, the color will itself change. These are all properties of this kind of color. The last one that we'll use to try to understand what's going on here is opal gems. For those of you that um, have, uh, have seen an opal gem, this is again like a, a brilliant color that changes as you rotate the gem. That is also structural color. So it's not a living example of structural color. It's actually produced in the natural world uh, through geological uh, processes. So these are all examples of structural color. And they're all related to those patterns that are on um, very small microscopic scales. Let me take a minute, minute to describe about why we might care about this uh, from the point of view of engineering or, or being people. So it's wonderful to look at in the natural world, but why might, might we want to do this to try to make this ourselves um, as humans? And the, re the reason for it is that there's some problems with the paints and coatings that we use in art uh, to paint our houses, to paint our homes which is that they fade over time. And the reason they fade is that they're, I talked earlier about how coloration comes from chemicals. Well, chemicals can get damaged by sunlight. Sunlight is amazingly strong for anybody that has, you know, well, painted a house or uh, had something sit out in the sun for a long period of time, you know it changes color. I have two examples here. One of a, of a paint uh, kind of sample over 36 months that uh, changed its color. Uh, due, due to sunlight, and another is an, uh, an artwork that actually was uh, faded due to sunlight as well. Wouldn't it be great, wouldn't it be environmentally sustainable if we had ways to paint, to cover things with, with color, to make things colorful, in which they didn't fade? And one of the things about structural color is that it's not really based on chemistry. It's based on those patterns, those very uh, intricate, beautiful patterns. And those patterns actually are very resilient. They're not due to chemistry. They're due to actually how the, how the volume of material is positioned. 
And so the idea is that um, if we could use structural color in certain applications, we would have sustainable color. We could have a, a color that would be very durable. So that motivates me as a chemical engineer to try to understand how this is done in the natural world. Can we do it as people? And can we use it for a product? So I'd like to take uh, uh, now kind of dive in and talk about how we're gonna try to do this in the lab. So I've talked about the scale of a human hair quite a bit in this uh, talk so far. It's about 100 microns in size. You can remember that number or you can just think about a human hair and I'll try to give all the length scales that we're talking about as some ratio of, of the width of a human hair. So we're gonna take building blocks that we can synthesize in our lab that are about a thousand times smaller than that of a human hair. They can have unusual shapes. They might look like needles, like I'm showing in the bottom left image, or they might be spheres. The important point is that there's this large range of length scales between molecules that are millions of times smaller than a human hair and the human hair itself. And this middle scale is the scale that we saw in nature where the structural color was produced. So if we can build structures ourselves as people in this range, then we have a hope that we might be able to produce structural color, just like is found in the natural world. So that's gonna be our strategy. These particles have a name, uh, they're called colloids. It's maybe not a name that you're familiar with, but I'm gonna, gonna actually argue in the next slide that you uh, use colloids every day and they are all around you. They're actually very benign. Um, and maybe as a good example of that, I think it's on the next slide here, a colloid is uh, basically milk, for example, or anything that looks cloudy often is made from colloids. A muddy river um, will also uh, often have colloids in it. These again are particles that are super small, again, a thousand times smaller than a human hair. And when they're kind of in solution like this, there's enough of them that they'll block light. So the reason why your milk looks milky like looks like you can't actually see through it is because there's all these colloids moving around uh, and they block the light. And they block the light in a way that just doesn't give you any interesting color. And what we're gonna be trying to doing is we're gonna try to all organize those colloids in a way where they only block certain wavelengths of light and amplify others. Now, if I were to take a microscope and uh, look at milk, um, what you would see is on the right-hand side here. This is a picture of colloids. Uh, it's not actually milk, but it's like uh, it's something that we can look at in the lab with the microscope. Each of these particles is, uh, in this case, is about 100 times smaller than a human hair. And when I start this movie, you'll see what actually what milk looks like. I hope this movie will work. And it is. I think it is. So right now you can see, uh, hopefully it's coming across over to you in Korea, that uh, there's a bunch of particles there and they're kind of all jiggling around, moving around randomly. This is something uh, that was... Uh, 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 that uh, is called Brownian motion. It was actually discovered by a scientist named Brown and uh, explained theoretically by Einstein. And uh, Einstein received a, a Nobel Prize for understanding why those molecules jiggle around like they do. And it's because they're being bombarded by even smaller molecules of the, of the solvent, of the liquid. So milk is mostly water, but it has these colloids in it. And in this case, they're uh, droplets of fat and protein and uh, they move around and um, they're there at a concentration that makes them look uh, like, like they do. So that's, uh, that is um, what we'll be talking about going forward. We're gonna use that to make, try to make patterns. But before we do that, I wanted to address the part of the talk where I spoke about medical device treatments. Well, there's another organism that is the same size uh, as colloids, and those are bacteria. And bacteria, you know, can make us very sick. There's many ways uh, and uh, many kinds of organisms that can invade us and bacteria, one of them, and it's what we use antibiotics to, uh, to try to treat. One of the large sources of, of um, hospital, uh, um, hospitalizations in the United States are due to infected medical devices and they're often infected by bacteria. If you look on the surface of say a dialysis catheter uh, or a catheter that you might have in your heart, um, these can be infected with bacteria and they end up looking very much like those solutions that I just showed. The bacteria are about the same size and they become absorbed onto catheter surfaces at very high concentrations and they're very resistant to antibiotics. So I'm showing here um, a model of a, of a catheter in the body on the left. Uh, the central image is now a zoomed in on the catheter with an electron microscope 
And then if I zoom in again, down to this scale that's about 100 times smaller than a human hair, you see a collection of bacteria that look very much like those particles I was showing you earlier. Our lab has been for many years collaborating with medical doctors to try to understand what this is. This is a biofilm. It's called these bacteria when they get together like this, they're called biofilms. Um, and sometimes you can actually grow them to the size that you can see them. This is a biofilm on an artificial catheter. And we've been developing methods to control that based on the fact that they, these bacteria have the same properties as colloids. And if you zoom in on biofilms, uh, on the top left is uh, what a biofilm might look to your, to your eye uh, at, on an infected medical device that would be in um, one's body. If you zoom in on one scale, uh, you can see that it covers the device. And this is now micro, uh, these are micro images from our lab. And then if you zoom in again, now you see these individual particles uh, that are colonizing the device. They look very much like the same particles that we saw in milk. And you can zoom in on them and see their individual structure. And then if you use an electron microscope on the left, you can see then the individual cells. So these colloids obey physical laws that we as engineers understand. And one of the treatments that we've been developing is heat. Um, in, in conjunction with the antibiotics is we've learned that as you, if you apply heat to biofilms on, on devices, like you might be able to do by gently warming a catheter surface, you can actually uh, destabilize the bacteria. You can both kill them and actually break off those biofilms from the device and clear off the device, medical device infection. This is uh, showing now temperatures as you heat up 37 degrees C as the normal body temperature. 45 degrees C is a range in which many cancer treatments operate, and 60 degrees is close to what a human uh, can, uh, right at the limit of what a human can tolerate. Um, the bottom image I draw, show, draw your attention to, the green cells are healthy bacteria, and the red cells are uh, dead bacteria. And so we've been working with treatment strategies that supplement antibiotics by um, using physical methods that are based on these colloid structures that are the same kinds of structures that are in milk and that will be in the that are relevant to structural color, but using them uh, to understand uh, treatments in, in, in the body. One thing about everything that I've spoken about to this point is that those little points of light you can see is that they're they're not ordered, they look random. And uh, that is actually what we're going to try to change now in the last part of the talk. And to do that, I'd like to just talk a little bit about order versus disorder. And to do that, I'm gonna use um, uh, cannonballs as an example, though you could use billiard balls or marbles. Here's two images. The top one is a disordered stack of cannonballs and the bottom is an ordered stack of cannonballs. And you can see they look very different, same number of cannonballs, but one of them is stacked in what you can think of as a crystal arrangement and the other is just a pile. Well, it turns out that that's the difference between disorder and order. And for order, we'll typically call those crystals. And the analogy to what, you know, to crystals that we have in our homes is, uh, is, is very good. So if you look, for example, at silica, which you can make uh, is what quartz is made out of and also what window glass is made out of. If you look at the molecular scale, quartz is ordered and glass is disordered. And if you look at natural quartz, you can see when it grows, it has these crystalline shapes. If you look at natural, natural glass, it doesn't have any crystal shapes. It doesn't have any sharp edges. It's disordered. So everything that I've shown you about colloids at this point has been disordered. The, bi the biofilms were disordered bacteria. The milk was disordered colloids. The key to structural order, I will argue, is in the, to structural color is in the order. And to do that, we can take a clue from opal gems. On the left is an opal gem that is of two kinds. One's called common opal and the other is called precious opal. And you can see this thing that is the dull gray, that is common opal. And if you look microscopically, you see this disordered structure. And then the center part, the brilliant blue is opal gem or precious opal. And that has the ordered structure that you see in the bottom. So the key to producing those blue butterflies is to make an ordered structure 
like in the bottom right, bottom right image, and not a disordered structure like in the top left. And the, this picture of a gem really shows that beautifully. That that's what we need to do. And so that's what we went into the lab and did. So this is now taking those colloids that were originally disordered, and now we've made them ordered. So they're still jiggling around. They're still undergoing Brownian motion like Einstein predicted that they should, but they've now been organized into these configurations. And we, over the years, have developed three or four different ways to do this um, that range from applying electric fields to using gravity cleverly, or also to designing forces between these colloids. I won't go into those today, except to say that that versatile method allows us to make these ordered structures. And then when we go into the lab, this is now in our laboratory. Um, this is a graduate student, Chen Yu Lu, that did this work. You see the same kinds of brilliant structural color. Um, these specimens, if they were not ordered, they would just look milky white, like milk. But once you order them, they have these brilliant colors and the colors change with angle, just like you would see in an opal gem. So I have just three more slides to go and I'd like to take one more step, which is to ask the question, can we make these in a way that the color would change with time? So this was inspired by this beautiful video from a marine biologist that I'll just show a few seconds of. It's gonna, I'll start it in just a moment. It's gonna show a rock. I just want you to watch that rock. It's a rock in the sea. Just watch the rock for a while and uh, we'll see what beautiful things life oh, can do. Oh, what's the name of Jose? Now I So hopefully you can see that. I'll stop the video. The octopus is going to go away now. So that was very quickly. That was an octopus that was uh, that was uh, that was uh, that was an octopus that was uh, on a rock, and uh, it was camouflaged, and it was using a variety of colorization mechanisms to do that. One of which was based on structural color. The other is based on uh, some dyes that it uses. Uh, but it's able to actually change its color in response to a stimuli. Wouldn't it be great if we could change color in the lab? So everything that I'm showing you to this point is always one color, but could we change it? And we've designed fields. We've applied electric fields in ways that um, I'll try. This is now in the lab. Uh, this is a student taking an image with a cell phone camera. And you can see how the color is changing as we turn a field on and off. So it's going to go from milky white to a more brilliant blue and we can go back and forth. And these are real time images. And we're basically having those colloids go from being crystals being ordered to being disordered. We can also actually change the color in real time going from greens to blue. And just to wrap up here and take your questions, this is a little bit whimsical. We've actually learned how to do this with lasers and we can actually now uh, we can now organize color on the scale of a human hair. So the width of the object that you'll see that we're going to produce here is about 100 microns uh, in width. It's about 100 colloids across, and you'll see what we're able to do. We're able to produce order on very small scales as we turn on the field. We can make a block M, and uh, when we turn the field off. Uh, through diffusion, that block M is going to go away. I'll show that once more just in case it went by a little bit fast. So we're going to turn on our field. So again, that M, block M, is about the width of a human hair. And we can organize colloids onto that scale uh, through the app, through the right, through this right mechanism. And when we turn off, if you don't like that color scheme, this, the student that did this, younger Kim, uh, she uh, did some Photoshop work, and we can make that into a maze in blue um, this, uh, as, as, the, as the field goes on. This video is on YouTube. It's our, it's our, our group's most uh, downloaded or watched video. It has about 100,000 hits. Uh, and uh, it shows basically, uh, and this is all done uh, with the same kind of physics that we learned from why butterflies are blue. So with that, I'm going to conclude by with a, just a shout out to my students. These are all Rackham students. They're doctoral students. Uh, the left-hand image is a, a spring picture that we took a number of years back of the group at the time. Uh, younger Kim is in the pink uh, shirt on the left-hand side of your image. 
Uh, she's the one that did the block M at the end. And there are a number of other graduate students that participated in the work in that picture. And the right hand image is our current group. Of course, we have to meet by Zoom. And uh, this was on May 4th. So we were having a May the 4th be with you moment. And uh, you can see that uh, that's all of us there doing the best that we can under Zoom. So with that, um, I'd like to conclude. And uh, I'd be happy to uh, take, I'll, I'll uh, stop uh, sharing the screen so I can see you all. And uh, I would be happy to take any questions you would have. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk about some work that is very dear to my heart and hopefully was, was uh, uh, some, light, uh, um, and some light science for you uh, this evening. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. So um, we're a group of enough size that if you want to raise your hand or unmute, you can ask Mike a question or you can also type in the chat and I'll be watching that um, as well. Um, while people are thinking of their questions, I'm going to ask Mike, how do you work with, you, you mentioned that you're working with doctors, is that, um, I'm curious to know how you work with other schools or like Michigan Medicine in your lab. Yes, so um, great, great question. There's a lot of really good links with our, um, with Michigan Medicine, the hospital and the medical school. Um, I'll tell you the story. So that collaboration is with um, uh, two emergency medicine doctors. Uh, the collaboration began actually about 10 years ago when uh, I had a piece of equipment in my lab that uh, a, a, an MD, a doctor, had heard about and uh, tried, to, tried to actually wanted to just use it to get some measurements on a material that he was working with. So why, I was showing him how to use the instrument and why we were there, I was like, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's some bacteria. And then I was looking at the data. I was like, wow, that looks just like what we see for colloids. And so we got to talking about it. And uh, that was actually really the, both of our interests. Like there's a lot of opportunity for faculty to collaborate together. It's a very interdisciplinary place at Michigan. Just that chat, actually, we just continued the conversation. We wrote like a, a, um, like a seed grant from the medical school. And then eventually we got an NIH funding to pursue that work. And uh, there's been uh, probably about five PhD students that have that have kind of gone on to different industry careers uh, and academic careers based on that line of reasoning that really just got going based on a uh, based on a conversation that, um, that you know seems very serendipitous but actually happens all the time at a place like University of Michigan where people are on the lookout for new connections and and mm -hmm. uh, new directions for their research. Thanks, Michelle. That's a great question. I'm happy to answer further. So I have a question. Yes. Hello, uh, Professor Solomon. It's nice to meet you. So my name is Jiyoung Park. I'm a graduate uh, of Rackham, 2006 in physics. And what a fascinating talk. It's really uh, interesting. Uh, my question uh, regards the color blue, uh, because we're Michigan. Uh, but so you did talk about how blue actually is, is really difficult to find in nature. Uh, for instance, pigmentation and bioluminescence uh, blue is where it was interesting because in physics, I mean, blue laser has been the toughest, you know, part of wavelength that has been able to kind of, you know, produce for many decades. So is there a reason that blue seems to be the difficult thing to find in nature? Yeah, no, this is interesting to me as well. So I think, you know, my, what I've said is just kind of an observation that I've read in the literature that blues and greens somehow life, uh, one, one reason why I think, and this is really, it gets a little bit out of my field, but the, the molecules that tend to B pigments um, are these carotenoid molecules, and they tend to absorb uh, in these wavelengths that are that are in the blues. So then, then you end up seeing like the yellows and the reds. It's the reason why I like leaves. So the you mean the the big green pigment that's out there is chlorophyll, right? And that's kind of the primary. You know, you don't really think of it as a pigment so much, but it but it really is. And all these pigments actually typically have functions besides coloration. Like they're meant to do something in plants, usually related to energy harvesting. So, you know, there are a few dyes. So if you look at say like um, like uh, some flowers, pansies, like the the uh, there's there's one pigment that is kind of in this purple range. But the by and large, actually, the pigmentation tends to be more on the on the red to yellow to orange side. And I think it has. Um, you know, this, this is really out of my area, but it just seems that um, the function of biological of these pigments isn't always about um, isn't always about coloration. It's about harvesting the sun, and that might drive where the colors are showing up. 
that's my best answer, but it's a great question and it's one I've wondered about. I think it's just one follow up. So then uh, blue is naturally hard to find, but you know, butterflies and other animals showed us actually do are able to produce, you know, blue structurally. Do you think there's like an evolutionary pressure advantage for having those colors if you know blue is hard to find in nature? Yeah, I so uh, it seems to me yes, and um, and I, but I, I probably need to stop there. So I think this is you can see like um, you know I've I've been. Uh, I'm not an expert kind of in biological coloration. This is kind of very, very true often for engineers. Like we are inspired by what we view in the nature, natural world, but we need to collaborate with an actual evolutionary, uh, I need to be collaborating with an evolutionary biologist um, or a, a structural biologist or a molecular biologist to really to, to give you kind of good scientific answers to those questions. Um, you can kind of see the limits of, um, of or maybe even how I work as a as somebody that does engineering science is that I read those literature, I'm inspired by them, and I ask questions about how that actually happens, and then try to do it in the lab. But often, um, and this is my collaborator in emergency medicine, just to connect to the previous connection, you know, we would talk about like why do bacteria do these things, and we would try to kind of develop evolutionary biology mechanisms. But my collaborator, who is a microbiologist, would always say, you know, got to be really careful about making uh, developing ideas about what bacteria are doing in, in people's bodies because bacteria have been around for billions of years and the reasons they do things typically are much are not related at all to people because they've been around for so much longer than people have been so so uh, but these are these are great questions and you know the answer to them often do inspire us to do new research so i i as i can learn these things i i try to do, try try to do that it's a great okay. question thank you yeah. thank you yes Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Jim. Uh, I cannot, I mean, thank you for your lecture, but I cannot ask a question about the topic. <laughs> so I'd like to ask you about uh, education at the University of Michigan. Uh, after this pandemic is under control, uh, many people predict that uh, education and learning, teaching and learning will not be the same before the coronavirus and after. And how, how do you project? How is the teaching and learning at the university, especially uh, probably underground, undergraduate programs, uh, will they use a lot of online uh, materials? I mean, online system and the, the pedagogies and all that. So how do you see the pandemic, this pandemic is transforming the learning and teaching at the university. Yeah, yes, I think it absolutely will. We've learned so much um, in the last year. So just a couple comments that won't be very well connected because I think it's a, you know, we don't really know the answer. One of my colleagues has, uh, has, has read about disruptive change and I think this pandemic and how higher education, how University of Michigan has responded has been a disruptive change. People often kind of overestimate how much a disruptive change, um, the effect of it over a short time period, over like a year or so, and they underestimate the impact 10 years later. And so I think lots of people are saying there's gonna be a lot of change in the next year. I'm not so sure about that. I think we just need to kind of like get going, right? And and not forget all the wonderful things that we've learned how to do and actually how fast we can change. So things that, you know, just in the space of like, we could, we never thought we could, you know, even have a call like this, like just, this was really not even on our radar screen a year ago. Now this is easy for all of us, right? So these things I think will be uh, increasingly incorporated. I think there's student patterns, like students we think do learn better in person, but they really like the ability to take classes from wherever they are. And so I think there's some things to be worked out there uh, in terms of balancing convenience and access, which is you know very important for learning. Like, you know, let's offer an education to people wherever they are, whatever their circumstances. Um, but how do you learn best? And what are the components of that are in person that we really need to establish that? So I do think that there's going to be profound changes. I think that they will come later. Um, I, th I think, and so what we're trying to do right now at Rackham uh, across the university is not lose our know-how to keep 
the space open so that we don't close off any of these really exciting future avenues. But I do think it will some, take some time to do them. So one, one, and one example of that is that, you know, probably the, probably the right answer is like some kind of hybrid, right? Where you use the in-person where it's needed and you use the, the remote where it's needed. But faculty this year have found that to be exhausting. Like to, to hybrid instruction has been like the faculty were fine instructors have really one request for next year, which is I can do remote and I can do in person, but please don't make me do both at the same time. And that makes a lot of sense to me. It's, it can be really challenging to, to manage what you, what you see here, right? And then the other 15 people that are over there, right? Uh, and so that, that, is, that has been a challenge. And so, uh, but I think those problems will be solved over time. And I'm very optimistic that we have learned a ton from this period. And some of it is like about the technology and the practice, but another is our own capabilities for change. And, uh, you know, I, I just go back to this point that um, higher education changes very slowly. I think there's, a, there's been a sense that, you know, things work and they've worked a long time and we don't want to change. And Rackham's own strategic vision in this space really is trying to catalyze change in graduate education. And I think some of the things that faculty thought were uh, insurmountable hurdles actually are not quite the hurdles that we thought they were. And so uh, that, would be the, that would be the positive going forward message that I'm trying to capture from the, from the pandemic at the moment. Um, so I just wanted to remark that we have a couple more minutes. So maybe if there's one quick question, I can take that before we wrap up. Sure, happy to. Dr. Ahn? Yeah, um, hi. Um, let me introduce myself. My, uh, my name is Dr. Ahn. I'm a professor at the Seoul National University. I'm currently working as a Dean of International Affairs of Seoul National University. Um, uh, I, I'm really glad to, uh, to hear your uh, very excellent lecture and also the University of Michigan's effort to recruit and uh, support international students. As you know, uh, for international cooperation area, we, we have a lot of problems now. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, let you know that uh, we have very strong alumni network in Korea uh, for Michigan. So if you have anything uh, you need uh, to mobilize us, then just let us know. Uh, we, we are ready to support uh, your international uh, academic activities uh, that may be hugely hampered because of this corona situations. Um, so that, that's, that's all of all, all, all my messages. Thank at this you. Point. Thank you. No, I've had the pleasure to get to know um, the Korean Alumni Club over many years. Uh, I first met Dr. Young, I think it was uh, well, it was um, when we had the, um, the uh, alumni meeting uh, in Seoul. So that must be probably three or four years now. And I've been really uh, delightful to, to get to know you all and, and understand um, you know, the ways in which you, uh, uh, you know, are connected to Michigan, but also support your students um, as, as they go. And so I, I mentioned those 250 students and we have a group that come every, every year and uh, you know, there are challenges at the moment. And so these connections are really uh, helpful and powerful. So thank you. Dr. Young? Mike, uh, let me say a few words about Professor Ahn, who just spoke. Have you met him before? I'm not sure we've had the pleasure of meeting. So it's nice he, to meet you, you know, virtually. He, he, he uh, is currently uh, Dean of the International uh, Affairs, I think, at the Seoul National University. But he studied economics and also law school. So he's a, one of the leaders in the you know international trade uh, issues. So uh, I think uh, it's good for two of you to know each other because you are positions at the moment. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank That's you very it. much. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Yes. I guess back to you all. So I, I just, I'll just close with just the, again, a big thank you for the opportunity to engage with you. You know, it's a difficult moment. I'm really wonderful that we, you know, this is great discussion and participation and I'm yeah. really, Michelle and I and uh, Chris, we're all really delighted to be able to connect with you virtually at this moment. Thank you. Thank you again for your excellent presentation. And uh, we'll see you hopefully Sooner than later. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Very much hope so. Very much hope yeah. that. Okay.
Thank you. Bye. And we'll send an email out with the recording and the slides to everybody. Um, you'll get it at the end of next week. Okay. Thank you. Great. Go yeah. blue. Thank you. Go blue. Go blue. Bye-bye.